So I'm happy to uh, introduce David Shields, who's here for the Seattle International Film Festival. He has an amazingly provocative film about none other than Marshawn Lynch, who's still beloved in this town, Seattle, Washington. I really uh, appreciate you coming by. I've been a fan of yours distantly. We've never met before, no. even though we live in the same town, no, apparently, <laughs> uh, because I read your book, Bla uh, Black Planet, tw like 20 years ago right. or something. I thought it was one of the most fascinating, insightful uh, analyses of race in the NBA, Thank and now, you. 20 years later, you have something that's very, the topic is very similar, but it uh, applies primarily to football and to uh, Marshawn Lynch. And so that's what that's why I was intrigued by, I Thank want to talk to you even before I saw the movie, Thank now that I've so seen much, the movie, Tom. I'm very, uh, very happy you're here. Anyway, that's why we have the great David Shields here. Thank you're you. primarily a writer, is this your first film? It is my first film. I was the co-star of a film called I Think You're Totally Wrong, A Quarrel, okay. which I wrote the book, co-wrote the book with my former student, Caleb Powell. Okay. That another former student, James Franco, the actor and director, sure. made a, a cool indie movie of it. Oh, and great. Okay. Caleb and I star as <laughs> ourselves, stumbling through our starring roles, yes. playing ourselves two guys arguing about life and art. So I feel like on some level that film got my film Jones going. Yeah. Because I had such a good time. I found my sort of buried ham in that movie. Like I really enjoyed <laughs> being on screen. I see. Weirdly. I have like I have an ancient relative named Joseph Schilkraut who won an Academy Award, you know, in 1941 or something. And I feel like somewhere buried in my past is some vaudeville it's a, gesture. A late in life there emergence of a, the performer. So in my early old okay. age, I've become in love with film. But yeah. this is indeed my first direct, directorial debut. Okay, and so I guess I hadn't mentioned the name of the film. We have it right here. here it's it called is. Lynch, A History. When I first saw this in the film pro program, I thought it was David Lynch. It just seemed a documentary in the film festival. I was thrilled to see that, not that I don't like David no. Lynch, but to see uh, something about Marshawn Lynch. So I wanted to ask you about what it is, as a subject matter, what is it about Marshawn Lynch that wanted you to make this movie, as opposed to, there are a lot of other controversial totally. sports personalities, a lot of them on the Seahawks. Totally. Michael Bennett, Sherman, you know, Richard Sherman, yeah, Earl, Colin Kaepernick, yeah, yeah. Er Earl Thomas, maybe? It, yeah. But, no, I'm so, sorry. Anyway, so what is it about Marshawn Lynch that you decided, yeah, he's the guy I want to zero in on? You know, as they say, he has my heart. <laughs> you know, that he's, that silence. Yeah. That silence is so damn interesting. I don't know if you remember um, that old Herman Melville novella, Bartleby, The, the, the Scrivener, Scrivener. of course. In which he says, I would prefer not, not to. Not to. And that. Marshawn oh is the original oh. I would prefer not to. That's hilarious. And You're bringing in Bartleby the Scrivener, we actually a 19th had century. We actually had it in part of the film at is some it? point, and at some point it seemed slightly literary. Is where that right? Yeah, there was a, a slightly. So, there was a, a sort of a movie version of, oh, of yeah. Bartleby, and we had the actor Crispin Glover saying, oh. I would prefer not to. Oh, perfect. Which seems sort of perfect. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, I'm really, you know, I've done in a way a trilogy of three things. Okay. I did a book about Ichiro about Ichiro's mockery of American sports cliches. It's a book, I don't wow. know if you ever saw no. that one called B Baseball is Just Baseball, The Understated Ichiro. Okay. Black Who, Planet yeah. is, I'm sorry. So go ahead, so explain, so the, the premise of Black Planet, I found, so this has been 20 years ago, I've not read it since. Right. But one of the th some of the things that I remember from it was that basically you have a lot of white guys sitting around watching a lot of rich black guys, rich white guys sitting around watching a lot of rich black guys, and even though they're opponents of each other, they have much more in common with them among themselves than they do with the people that are paying the money to watch them. You've summarized but, the book beautifully <laughs> and concisely. Right? Is that right? Uh, yeah. And that, you know, basically that book in certain ways is an ode to Gary Payton, Gary Payton yes. and his beautiful motor mouth, the way in which he uses language in a very transgressive way. Yes. You know, I'm a writer. I'm interested in using language in a transgressive way, too. Yeah. Not just using, I mean, no offense, but, you know, not just using journalistic cliches about sports or something yeah. like that. Like, how can we make language poetic? Yeah. Ichiro did it or does it through... By not talking by in sort English. Of, by not talking, he actually has... Very good command of English, as you probably know. Yes, I know. Oh, this is great. And, and there, yeah, goes, yeah. there goes my phone. Speaking about tra <laughs> transgression, right. uh, sorry about that. Well, um, apologies. But um, um, so Peyton transgresses through trash talking. Yeah. Ichiro through, to me, intentionally mangling American sports cliches. 
and intentionally Lynch, to okay. me and Lynch and Lynch through this rather eloquent silence. Yeah. And to me that I wanted to unpack that silence, the origins of Marchand's silence, the deepening and a sort of complication of Marchand's silence. Yeah. How that silence went very public and very viral in yeah. you know the height of the Seahawks' success. Yeah. How it then it got deeply political through Trump, through Kaepernick, through Super Bowls 48 and 49, and then how it's, in my view, become a kind of legacy to younger black athletes who, I don't know if you okay. have noticed, Tom, they, to me, have learned from Marshawn. I was wondering. How to push yeah. back, like, yeah. whether it's Russell Westbrook, yep. whether it's Paul Pierce, whether it's various people people to me he has handed off the yes. baton I was wondering how that was set up because it's clearly not, th this is near the end of the uh, end of the movie the very end of when, the movie. yes where you show a lot of other black that's my, athletes that's my favorite part of the movie <laughs> is that right? yeah and, I love that part. and basically they're shutting people up they're walking away from the table a lot of times sports reporters are going oh how rude you know how yeah. and it looks like I, I wanted to ask you is Marshawn Lynch seen as, you know, like the example and they're all following his example? Or is that an illustration of there are a lot of Marshawn Lynch's? It's not just Marshawn. I think it's both. But, like, yeah, as okay. they, I think it's a very good question because it's not as if Marshawn is some ancient wise elder yeah. from the 1940s. And here are these young men. I mean, yeah. he's just a couple of years older yeah. than they are, if that. Yeah. You know, and we show Popovich. No, I know. I was going to show. We show um, Belichick. Yeah. Belichick. And, and we show uh, the Dallas Cowboy what's coach. What's his name? It's, Jason Garrett, yes. I think. In which they, in their strange way. Yeah. And I think that part of the, the point the film makes is that not to always play at the race card, but there yeah. is a sense in which Belichick and Popovich yeah. get away do with it. get don't they? Yes. A wider path yes. than Marshawn. Belichick could not be m more obstreperous. Marshawnian. <laughs> exactly. He's yes. totally, it's a total Lynchian. Yeah. And yet, it's thought to be a lovable old crazy uncle. Yeah. Whereas Marshawn is thought to be yeah. oh, thuggish, uh, etc. Yeah. And so for me, it's a very good question, Tom. Are there a bunch of Marshawn? Sort of. Yeah. But I think he has really weaponized yeah. it. Yeah. He has shown how much poetry and majesty and, in a way, politics there are in staying cussedly silent. Yeah. Do you know, in saying, I'm just here so I won't get yeah, fined. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a weirdly poetic phrase. <laughs> yeah. Because it's about, it's about capitalism. That we're all here so we won't <laughs> yeah. get fined in yeah. many ways. Yeah, and the fact that it's repeated so often that everyone knows it so that even late night comics know what it is. It's I mean, a it's just, total it, meme in the culture. Exactly, and because of that, it does make it a, a poetic. Totally. It may not have been po meant to be poetic, but it has a meter, it has everything. And, I think and, that's and, exactly right. And he has yes. a very <laughs> musical sense of language. There's yeah. an opening of the film in w which a bunch, like a uh, announcer and a, a, a pro athlete, the Oakland Raiders, are urging him to ask them a sort of obsequious question. Yeah. And Marchant refuses to ask yeah. the question. He says, finally, I ain't got no questions. Yeah. And the way that he says it, to me it has such force. It's basically, <laughs> I've got answers. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I don't have questions. I've got this whole thing figured out. Yeah. And so to me, he's a. And this is when he was a sophomore at the, at the at, California, high, no, I think. I think oh, he was even he, in high school. He was in high really? school. Really? Okay. And that he basically is, you know, sort of an overused term. I think he's an old soul. Yeah. You know, like I think at 14, there was a melancholy about him, a sadness, a wisdom, a, uh, a kind of Oakland, I'll take nothing from you. Yeah. You know, I think that part of. My favorite part of the film is the way that we show how much Marshawn comes from, from Oakland. Oakland. Yes, there are so many yeah, a gifted whole string troublemakers. Of yes, from Bill Russell, yep. Alice Walker, Angela Davis, the Black Panthers, Hell's Angels, yeah. the first African American Studies Department, um, um, a whole galaxy of people across. The, I mean, you know, even Clint Eastwood. Who could be a more yeah, silent literally. killer than right. Clint Eastwood went to Marshawn's high school? Yeah. He went to o That's Oakland great. Tech High School. It's yeah. so perfect. Okay. So listen, we are all over the map already. A and little great. bit. One of the things is, so I'm watching the movie and I'm kind of taking notes and I realize I just at some point just gave up because it's just, just let it it so rich. Yes. Thank there are you. too many. You've got James Baldwin bits. I mean, there's, I mean, there, there's so many ways we can go with this. So I guess I think maybe just to zero it in, I, 
would you say there's, could you come up with a thesis of the movie to, to, to get across the point of why, because maybe we ought to explain how the movie's put together. Sure. You did not talk to, to Marshawn Lynch. You did not interview him. This is not like, not kind of insight by talking about his mother. You took no. whatever is available out there in the, in the world, and social media and everything else, and it's a compilation of things in order to make very direct points. Totally. You, again, you have summarized it awfully well, <laughs> that we approached him four years ago. Okay. Said, hey, Marshawn, you know, big fans, you know, yeah. that we'd like to do a movie about you and your use of silence as a form of protest. You know, th that if you want a thesis statement, yeah. so-called elevator pitch, that's kind of it. <laughs> yeah. It's Marchand's use of silence as a form of protest. Yeah. It's not just him being a court gesture. It's not just him preferring not to talk. It's not Marchand being shy. Although I think all those things are there. Play in, yeah. It's really the core of the film is to argue as strongly as we can through 700 clips mm -hmm. that Marchand is using silence as a form of resistance, protest, and defiance. Yes. But anyway, I approached him. Yes. Four years ago, his representative said, you know, basically thanks, but no thanks, that, yeah. you know, you guys make the movie, that we won't stop it. Okay. But that, you know, it's it's Marchand's style not to participate. That's in actually that more appropriate. It's <laughs> exactly. And we yeah. told him that we would have been bitterly disappointed <laughs> if he had participated <laughs> in the movie yeah. and, you know, hosted us with various mimosas. You know, yeah. like, it's like Marchand being Marchand yeah. said, no, you yeah. know, I would prefer not to. So was there anything <laughs> about Marchand's persona? Because you clearly had like a thesis in mind as you're putting this together. Right. As you were, as you were working on his biography or whatever right. clips it's you could find. Right, it's definitely a biopic. Were, yeah. you, were you surprised by anything or did it just reinforce your thesis and your suspicion about who he was? I think it's a good point. I think it was an open question. Yeah. And some people thought regarding my book 20 years ago, Black planet, right, yeah. they sometimes thought I was over-reading race. I, I yeah. think 20 years ago, that book feels like it's not over-reading race. <laughs> yeah. Because here we are in Black Lives Matter, Trumpian America, yeah. Me Too, you know, that in a way, I think that book, in a way, I would argue, is a slight pre-echo of, of where we are now. In regard to the Marchand movie, I wanted to make sure I wasn't over-reading everything yeah. th that he did yeah. as brilliantly political when maybe it was just Marchand being tired that particular evening and preferring yeah. not to talk. Yeah. So basically, the thing I was always questioning, and I was working with a, a key editor on it, my friend and collaborator, James Nugent, that we constantly asked each other, are we over, over reading it mm -hmm. or is there actually method to Marchand's madness? Yeah. So I feel like the big revelation to me Going back to age 14, he was a deeply political person from the beginning. You know, his father abandoned him and crucially always lied to him. He would always say, I'll meet you tomorrow and we'll spend the weekend together. Mm -hmm. And then the father would not show. Plus, right. growing up as a poor black man with a single mom in Oakland, he saw, you know, the dregs of capitalism. He was, you know, a relatively poor young man and through his athletic talent, you know, has become a, a successful yeah. and wealthy person. But basically, it was all there from at the beginning. So I feel like the thing, I was always questioning myself. Yeah. To me, if there's a revelation in it, it's that he had it figured out pretty early. You think so? I think so. So, I mean, I understand. I mean, I can the see the counter-argument, yeah, too. Yeah, okay, yeah. Then, then we don't need to do it. We already did, made that movie, apparently, right? How Two so? guys arguing about there, something. There you yeah. go. But, like, because, so, tell me your point. So, so the reason I asked the question, because what I was surprised at was how talkative he was That's at a good some point. point. That's that a good we, point. That he's become that I thought, rather than you seeing as, wow, he, I see the nascent of, of who he became when he was 14. Right. I saw, wow, look at who he was and who he became. I know. It's a so, good point. Yeah, okay. And I think those two are not mutually exclusive. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. In the sense that I think Buffalo is a surprisingly crucial part yeah. of Marchand's CV in the sense that I think at Cal and to a greater extent at Buffalo, Marchand tried to be a sort of get-along, to-go-along kind of person. Yeah. And he felt in the relatively small town of Buffalo in sort of snow encrusted Buffalo, you know, East Coast, smaller city, 
you know, it's very white with the snow and it's a very, you know, <laughs> relatively white city. Yeah. That Marchand felt that his friendliness, his accessibility, his openness was used against him. Two relatively minor car accidents were treated as evidence that he's this Oakland thug and we have to ship yeah. him off back to the West Coast. And I feel like that really had a crucial role in making Marshawn shut down. Yeah. He and got so, burned. He was open. He got totally, burned. He said, okay, totally, I learned that lesson. Totally. Yeah. So then in Seattle, he was, you know, I'm going to talk a bit, but not very much. And then as the Seahawks and he uh, ascended to the heights of, you know, yeah. the NFL, he talked less and less. Yeah. There's a wonderful line by Albert Camus, talk, you know, this is getting very literary, but... <laughs> You're Camus so says, pretentious. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but I, I eat it up. <laughs> the, he, there's a wonderful line of, of Camus that we thought of using the film. It was something like, uh. the only way to deal with an unjust society is to be so absolutely free that your very existence is an act of rebellion. Isn't that, that okay, beautiful? Okay, that's good, yes. The only way to deal with an unjust society yeah. is to be so absolutely free that your your very existence is an act of rebellion. Yeah. That's Marshawn to me. Yeah. To me, he's trying to be free, sometimes failing because yeah. he wants to cash out, as most of us do. But to me, that's huh. the movie. Yeah. That he's trying, you know, he's, a, he's very aware it's an unjust society. Yeah. Whether it's the No Fun League or whether it's Trump or whether it's America, or, or whatever, he's very aware it's an unjust society. Yeah. So I'm going to try to be free. Sometimes fail, sometimes, you know. So what do you mean by fail? When does he fail? Because this is one of the questions I, I wanted to zero in on this, because you create him as... A like, bit of a hero. A, yeah. A, a bit of a hero, but like, and rhetorically, the, the strat that everything he does and says it's is a gold. rhetorical strategy I that's know. brilliant. And I was wondering. Did you find I, it too much? Like, I, do you I, think it was. I like, find it, well, it just raises this question. I don't know. I love the movie because it, it, it bombards it with all sorts of challenging sure. ideas. Sure. I'm not sure I buy all of them. Sure. But one is, it, once you put him on this kind of rhetorical pedestal, then the question becomes can he do no wrong? Is there ever a point in which you can question? what he does and says on some other standards, or if he's always, if he's the role model of fighting the man, I know. then you can- Can he do no wrong? Exactly, that's I guess what I I'm asking. That's an excellent question, <laughs> okay. and I think it's worth talking about. Does the film err in turning him into a bit of a plaster saint? That we yeah. had parts of the film in which that we, I think the part of the film that's still there that argues that he, you know, that he wants to, up, oppose the so society, but he also wants to exploit it, that he wants to cash out. Yeah. And to me, the film has a very subtle, slight awareness that he wants to do all those various commercials, and that we do a yeah. sort of subtle commentary that, you know, he's willing to play the court gesture so long as if a Skittles yes. check clears. Yeah. And so I feel like... Or the like, beacon plumbing. <laughs> you know, and so I think that we are with Marchant. Would any of us turn down the five or six yeah. or seven figure check to, yeah. you know, endorse some product? Yeah. You know, as he's endorsing cars and candy and plumbing. And, you know, that we try to suggest that when you swim in capitalism, you get a lot of stuff thrown your way. Mm -hmm. That he's, in, a, in many ways, a very hard-headed businessman. You know, he's a very yeah. successful businessman yeah. with his, his Beast oh, Mode, mode. t-shirts yeah. and all that. And so I feel like, the, you know, there's a section toward the end of what I think of as Chapter 3. Okay. The Seahawks winning the Super Bowl. Yes. But before things curdle a bit between yeah. the Seahawks oh, and that's Lynch. That's a good word, curdle, yes. You know, that Lynch is cashing out quite seriously. You know, yeah. he's jumping into a vat of Skittles on the Conan O'Brien yeah. show. He's he's going on the I don't know what it's called, like the the shopping channel yeah. and selling product. That was hilarious. And so for yeah. me it's like and then I think there's an awareness that he's a complicated person who will do what's needed to make 
a serious buck. And yeah. I think that if the film has a complication to our portrait of yeah. Marchand, it's in his willingness to be a, a relatively happy participant in the capitalist machine, I yeah. think. Yeah. The thing is, and there's another surprise, I was asking about surprises, the delight he takes in some of those bits, I think that that shows a side of him that- That transcends it, exactly. right. Exactly. No, and I remember this was a, I can't remember which Super Bowl it was, but he, he wasn't, ta- must have been the second Super Bowl. He wasn't talking to the press, but he did like a Japanese candy commercial or something like that. That's hilarious that he does, he, he picks and chooses and he realizes totally. the, they're on a different planet, so to speak, that I can deal with this and I don't have to deal with all the repercussions that, that the, the other, the mainstream uh, has, a, has with it. So I think, I think that's, it's that's a very great. good point that he's, he's silent until he's not. Yes. And then I think there was one he's review. He's almost jovial. There was yeah. one review of the film that I thought made a really lovely point. It was a very generous review. But they said the film is not just about Marchand pushing back against the political system. Mm-hmm. It's also about how he tries to preserve joy. And that he is, uh, to me, a relatively yeah. joyous person. Yeah. Far more than say I am. Like he's a real, <laughs> you know, he's a very um, charismatic and magnetic and yeah. magnetic and to me joyous person. Yeah. Who's trying, you know, those crazy donuts if it, it, that yeah, he's doing right. at the yeah. car. The, yeah. And then in a way, you have a whole automotive section, in which there, is yes. really crucial, I think. <laughs> yeah. That he's, you know, it's like because you know, there's that crucial line in the film in which um, the rapper Little Boosie says, or a hip hop DJ asks Little Boosie. How does it feel to be roaming around the country as a free man? Yeah. And we come back you come a to that over and over. Yeah. And to me, that's the question is, yeah. how does it feel, Marshawn, to be roaming around the country trying to be relatively free? Yeah. I feel like the, we that's can good. all learn from him in the sense that I'm trying to be a bit of an artistic rebel, and yet I want to be a success, successful, you know, a moderately successful <laughs> capitalist. Yeah. How do we find a balance yeah. between opposing the culture and trying to succeed? Yeah. And I think that's a, a daily battle yeah. for Marchand. Was there any trepidation on your part of being a white man analyzing a black man? Totally. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. we, we question yeah, it dumb constantly. Question, huh? No, yeah. excellent. No, yeah. constantly. And we show the film to people. We have it, Danny Glover as an executive yes, I producer saw that. on the film who gave us all sorts of good advice. (laughs) Yeah. And um, Dottie Abe is the voiceover artist, uh, a local writer on hip hop. And I showed it to a lot of of black filmmakers and would get their input. Yeah. The thing that I kept on coming back to this, if it's wonderful line by Alice Walker, who also has East Bay connections. And she was asked, what should white men do? you know, in this moment. And she said, just shut up and listen for the next 350 years, <laughs> which, you know, is a wonderful challenge and yes. provocation. Yeah. What should, let's call them straight, middle class, middle aged or older yeah. white men do if you are politically sympathetic yeah. to say Black Lives Matter? Yeah. And I feel like that's a real challenge to me. And I feel like that what the film tries to do in a way is shut up and listen to Marshawn. Hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That we don't comment that much. No. That we have some quotes yes. from people like Melville and Baldwin and yeah. Stokely Carmichael and Angela Davis. And each one of them is like, it's like a little bomb that goes totally. off. Totally. Thank <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah. Thank They're you. They're rhetorical booms. I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. Like that wonderful line of, uh, of Louis Armstrong, which we oh, have, yeah. in which he says, nothing new. White man's still ahead, yeah, which that's to a, me yeah. is the prelude to Super Bowl Forty Nine. Wow! When, in Marshawn's view, yeah, the the ball was given to Wilson yeah. rather than to Marshawn. The white man, you're calling Russell well, Wilson the white man in aren't Marshawn's you? view. Yeah, he's the more assimilated okay. African American. That gets into some very complicated politics, which Absolutely. you know I'm not commenting on. No, I'm just trying to say. What is Marshawn's you really, take? Yeah, you really do a great job because you Thanks. raise all sorts of really provocative ideas, <laughs> but then you don't, you don't own them. Sure. You just say, hey, I'm just, I'm just throwing right. this out there. What do you make of these exactly. you know, juxtapositions? Thank but you. So, as long as you brought up the, uh, the Super Bowl 49. Right. <laughs> so. And this is the station on which <laughs> That's which right. broadcast we, the Seahawks. We are the Seahawks I know. This, this is, is great, great that we're doing it on the Seahawks so, land here, here. Here's the deal. 
You show, and I, you know, you probably know the number. T- it felt like 15 times. You show Russell Wilson it's cocking brutal. his arm. It's cocking brutal. his arm. Cocking his arm. You so, left-handed? Yes, I left-handed, yeah. yes. He's That's a right. righty. Right-handed, but yeah. yeah, but the idea is. Right. So the thing is, why did you do that so insistently besides just grinding a I Seahawks know. fan? You know, because part of me is I can't wait for the screening on on Monday at yeah. SIF because when – when we show that thing, it's like yeah, they're gonna start groaning. It's like vertigo. It's like yes. the, you know, it's like the the um, oh, that's good. You, you know what I mean? The, the, yeah, the yeah. Uh, shower in psycho. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. That was okay. a, a very good, a very Perfect. good knife noise that yeah. you made there. Um, you know what? So. You know that was an early editor. Christian Palmer came up with that, and yeah. James Nugent. You know, I worked very closely with these guys. What was the point of that? Well, it felt like a fan. I've relived that very moment My a God, million I'm times. I'm still recovering from I know. it. I can't. So, I'll never forget it. Like, it was brilliantly set up. But you raised. It's really interesting because that is the that's the big talk of the town. In fact, I remember when it was first suggested that oh, well, this is ridiculous. They they didn't give the ball to Marshawn. They didn't want him to be the hero. They wanted Russell Wilson. I thought nobody's going to risk the Super Bowl for that. I know. And yet, more and more now as the years have gone by, more and more people in that locker room really felt that way. And you suggested without endorsing. Like for me, it. it's like exactly yes. to me. One could argue. It was an unconscious thing. Like, ah, okay. Personally, if you ask me, yeah. did Pete Carroll say to Daryl Bevel, <laughs> hey, let's make sure that the less angry black man becomes <laughs> Super Bowl MVP yeah. rather than the more angry black man? <laughs> yes, check. I mean, obviously, you're not going to do that. Right. But on some, I mean, I think that's an amazing moment, which yeah. I could write a book about. I know. To you me, should. it's Pete Carroll trying to out mastermind Belichick. Are you think trying so? to yeah. do like being, being too clever second by and half. goal from the one exactly yeah. Belichick knew exactly <laughs> what was happening they had been practicing that play yeah. forever what was the the cornerback's name Malcolm Jake, yeah somebody, I forget the guy yeah who cut in and, Jenkins, and I don't want to remember Malcolm his Brown name. or something like yeah. that <laughs> and anyway and Marshawn's reaction is fascinating afward yeah he's oddly not happy but yes. he's he has this wonderful, he, this wonderful cat has eaten the canary smile, yeah. which is sort of nothing new. White man's still ahead. Like, you yes. still aren't going to give me the ball. It's like, really? I have never. Has been... nothing changed in 20 years? Like, apparently not. And yeah. that's the moment. And I, I don't think I'd ever seen it before. And, I, and I'm sure it's because of your film that it's pointed out. I probably have seen it a million times, but I don't remember that ever seeing Marshawn. him walking by and Pat Carroll coming this way. Oh, my God. It's heartbreaking. <laughs> yes. But he does. He has like the Cheshire Cat it's grin like, on himself. You like idiot. Yeah. That's, you know, like you want, you went that way. Yeah. And also, what's, yeah. it's, so, it's so absurd. Who knows what could have happened yeah. if Marshawn had uh, given you know, had yeah. been given the ball. And I think there are a lot of football reasons why. I mean, I love the, I that clip mean. that you include with uh, Carroll. I could have given him the ball. We could have run it and not have not scored. We could have scored. We don't really know. And that's the great thing about sports. You it's don't amazing. know. But yeah, the, uh, okay. And also part of it is this, a big part of film structure is you have to have a big gloom at that moment in the film, a literal or figurative death. And if, you know, that we wanted to push that death <laughs> yeah. so hard. It breaks your heart, yeah. and that you know, I don't know how we came up with the idea of the you know, yeah. but it was sort of like part of it was frankly a fair use issue that yeah. we could only use a little bit of it ah. in terms of fair use concerns, yeah. and I thought if we just went boom, 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 it would hammer it home. That's if you see what I mean? Because the very first time you see that play, you don't see the play; you see the aftermath of the play. The very you don't see you see him hugging his arm. I go. What, what, what do you happened? do that? But that is interesting if you're actually trying. That that actually might have worked more effectively. Because, wait a minute, we didn't even see the whole play as it developed. Because I, w- I was always wondering, yeah, where is Marshawn? In that play, He's where's, this where's, way. where's Marshawn? Yeah, going that way. Yeah, yeah. so. Marshawn as decoy? <laughs> like, here yeah. we are, obsessed with a game that happened five <laughs> years know. ago. Yeah, oh, but yeah. believe me, we're obsessed with that. Totally. Yeah. And that brings it up. Listen, I can just tell we could be doing this, this for 12 so hours. Great. We That's have so to fun. kind of wrap things up. So I've got a couple of quick questions I just want to ask you about. First up, do you equate his running style with his speaking style? There seem to be suggestions at times, like you quote somebody saying, he runs angry. And I was uh, wondering. Marshawn's high school coach, yeah. Yeah, is that what, that's who it is? <laughs> that's and a beautiful line. It is. And the, the thing is, 
he runs in such a um, an eloquent way that I think it, in some ways it's the opposite of his speaking style. If you think of his speaking style, it's becoming you know silent. But right. I'm just wondering, do you see any parallels between the way he plays football, tough as nails, nobody can get him down, and the way he kind of slogs through his life against you know fighting against the man who's always ahead of him, as Louis Armstrong says. Clearly, I mean, partly, I wanted to segue for a second to the film tries to mimic exactly Marshawn's running style. Ah. Those pivots, those twists, those turns, ah. compression, concision, velocity, violence, that we constantly told ourselves. That's very meta. Don't make the movie feel like a TV show. Don't ah. make it feel like a Ken Burns documentary. Yeah. Which is, you know, is great. Yeah, but, for you what know, it is. But polished and elegant yeah. and production values that we wanted to make our film have sort of street cred and sort yeah. of be Marchand like yeah. in its urgency and its I would call them violent juxtaposition. Yeah. So in terms of running style that we constantly told ourselves Beastquake is our filmic <laughs> aesthetic. Is that right? Make oh, that's our good. film yeah. Beastquake. So there's that. That's and then Marchand's high school coach would say we taught Marshawn how to run that way, that we mm. taught him beast yeah. mode, yeah. that basically that we taught him to run angry, yeah. that he was a man full, a young man, uh, yeah. uh, uh, a teenager full of anger toward his dad, toward his society, toward the rules of um, the culture toward the weird way in which Oakland is always sort of second fiddle to San Francisco yeah. in the Bay Area yeah. and even to Berkeley. And he was an angry young man, hugely angry, you know, angry at his mom for a certain brief time, hugely angry at his dad, etc. And apparently they kind of developed this style to mm -hmm. be just furious, you know, as, as Marchand says at the very end of the film throughout, run through an yeah. MF state. I don't yes. know if I can say bad words yeah. on there. <laughs> yeah. But he says, you know, run through a mother F's face. Yes. And it's like, that's the whole movie yeah. because his speech, yeah. in a way, is angry, but in a different register, if you see what I mean. Uh -huh. That sure. we try and show in that silence is ferocity. Like mm -hmm. we have this wonderful quote of Claudia Rankin who says, <clears throat> it's a documentary about a silence that isn't really a silence. Yeah. To me, that silence is a howl of fury. Yeah. And so even though you could say that Marchand's speaking style yeah. is, you might say, minimalist, yeah. and his running style is very much maximalist, yeah. there's a connection, which is violence. They're both about anger. Yeah. The silence expresses it indirectly, the running style expresses it directly. And that's the very last image we see in the movie, is that... Is run through. Yeah, exactly. And it's a perfect way to end it. Thank you. And we're going to use that to end this conversation. We could go on for I hours, I can tell. It's, it's so great to excellent. chat. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Nice Lovely to chat. David.